Hello everyone, the Green Scorpion here, and when it comes to video game weapons, bows are a personal favorite. They are one of the earliest forms of ranged weaponry, other than throwing stuff, and there is just something about the engineering of a bow that, for the time that it was invented, is a marvel. Unlike some of the other weapons that we've looked at so far, firing arrows takes a considerable amount of skill and dexterity to even begin to work. Bows can be categorized into two categories, regular or composite bows, and crossbows, and both of which require finesse and accuracy. While the skills and functions differ for a compound bow and a crossbow, both kinds of bows are considered for this list. Arrows in general are very aerodynamic, but also require the archer to consider wind, gravity, and contact points when aiming. In general, more so than the other weapons discussed so far, using a bow requires the warrior to be smart and calculating. Archers in video games tend to be of an intelligent, observant, and oftentimes snarky demeanor. In strategy, the archer needs time and focus to get off a perfect shot, and they tend to require protecting if melee enemies get too close. Stealth, evasion, and speed are all welcome attributes to the archer who values his or her head. These 10 archers are the characters that I feel optimize on the advantages of the ranged weapon, cover for the weaknesses, and have that kind of wit necessary for getting an arrow from point A to vital organ point B while under perilous conditions. So now, I'm going to count down the top 10 video game archers. Ready? Aim? Let's get started! Let's say you are given the choice between a bow and an assortment of guns for your next big mission. Unless you're a Hawkeye or Green Arrow, you would have to be crazy not to choose the bullets. Joseph Turok is a little crazy. Now I can't say I know too much about Turok as a character, and from what I can tell, he does not have much of a personality to speak of. I just have some memories of playing the Turok series on the N64. Turok has an impressive arsenal for taking down packs of Velociraptors, including the Cerebral Boar, which fires homing drills that burrows into enemies' skulls and then explode. But his default is a trusty bow. Turok is no caveman, however. The tech bow, as it is called, is specifically engineered to get the full amount of force and precision necessary for maiming prehistoric predators. Recently, the Turok series was rebooted for the Xbox with the game simply called Turok. The main character, Joseph Turok, is probably a descendant of the original N64 Turok seeing as he has some Native American background. And don't go thinking that because he is Native American he's old-fashioned and fights just with a bow. Actually, he has four weapon slots for just as diverse an assortment of guns and launchers. However, he keeps two of those slots reserved for his hunting knife and his trusty bow, in case he wants to go for the silent kill. Turok may not exclusively fire arrows, but he makes the level-headed decisions of when to go with the old and faithful. In Super Mario RPG, Mario and friends and Bowser team up to combat the Smithy Gang, an army of anthropomorphic medieval weaponry. The lieutenants of the Smithy Gang include Mac, a bouncing sword, Yuridovich, a compilation of spears, and our number 9 archer, Bowyer, who is in fact his own bow. Bowyer commands a regiment of living arrows called Arrows and fires them at his enemies. Bowyer was sent to the peaceful Rose Town to prepare it for the military occupation and secure the second star piece needed to repair Star Road. Apparently, his way of preparing Rose Town is by hiding out in the forest maze and randomly firing at Rose Town from miles away with poison-tipped arrows that will petrify the residents. What's really crazy is that he does hit them! Almost all of them! From hundreds of miles away! Without any clear sight line! That's insane! And Bowyer is pretty insane too, now that I think about it. He speaks in an astrophy, putting the subjects of his sentences at the end in a way that makes him sound like Yoda, and randomly saying, Nyaaah! It takes the all-star team of Mario and company to take him down. During the fight, not only does he summon arrow minions, fire them, and use lightning magic, he can also shoot out buttons of the SNES controller, making it momentarily impossible to either basic attack, special attack, or use items. So not only can his arrows headshot a toad from one city over, they can also pierce through the fourth wall! Boyer is pretty amazing. 
and if he wasn't so unorthodox, he would have given the rest of the archers a run for their money. I tried not to. I really tried not to. But Link is one of the greatest archers in video games. Yes, Link is known more for his sword and shield, and we even ranked him number 9 on the top 10 sword wheelers list. But next to that, Link's most trusted weapon is the bow and arrow. Be it the hero's bow, the fairy bow, or whatever other arrow hurling piece of wood, Link has been an archer for 15 out of the 16 canon Zelda games. Some might suggest that Princess Zelda herself be included, as she helps out in a few final boss battles with light arrows, but despite a nice final smash and brawl, we haven't seen Zelda's archery nearly as much as Link's, and he has a pretty nice track record for flinging points into fiends. In the original Legend of Zelda, Link's bow oddly took his ammunition straight out of Link's wallet, and the silver arrow was needed to defeat Ganon. And while Link often does get a slingshot or a boomerang earlier in the game, neither have ever compared to the ranged damage of his bow. Besides fighting, Link often uses his arrows to solve puzzles, most notably shooting them through torches to burn away faraway targets. Over the years, Zelda fans have seen a lot of variation with the bow. Link can fire while on horseback, he can charge the arrows with fire, ice, or evil searing light, he can strap bombs to them, which goes against all rules of physics, and with the Hawkeye from Twilight Princess, he becomes a regular sniper. I especially like Link's bow in Soul Calibur 2, which was one of the few ranged attacks in the game and could be aimed down to shoot Nightmare in the foot. Link's crossbow training, an underrated little Wii gem, has Link trying out a crossbow with a scope, bomb arrows, and magic rapid fire. Link does not always shoot arrows, but when he does, make sure you get out of the way. Yep, I played Maple Story for a little while. It isn't great, and I'm not really into MMOs to begin with, but I had fun while it lasted. This game has a huge world that always teases you to want to get stronger so that you can venture out and survive the increasingly dangerous monsters to see what other lands there are. It is just a little too grind heavy for my taste. Still, it happens to be home to a class of unparalleled archers. At the beginning of the game, you are given the choice between four classes, the warrior, the mage, the thief, and the one I knew I had to try, the bowman. Surprisingly though, the bowman is the least popular of the four, mainly due to its low defenses and the fact that it takes more time to get experience at first. Plus, you need to buy arrows. You start as just an archer. As an archer, you can fight mushrooms and angry pigs without fear, because you're several feet away while firing, and your arrows have enough of a knockback to keep them from reaching you. The most impressive thing you'll do is the occasional double shot, and other players won't be too interested in inviting you to the training parties. But you'll show them! At level 30, you upgrade to your second job, a hunter or a crossbowman, depending on what kind of bow you prefer. The crossbowman can shoot iron arrows through multiple enemies, while the hunter gets bomb arrows to stun a pack of them and to do heavy damage. Plus, both classes get Soul Arrow, which allows the bowman to summon arrows with his spirit, reducing the need to buy more in the shop. The hunter and crossbowman become the ranger and sniper respectively. I never got this far, but the ranger adds fire to his attacks while the sniper adds ice. They can shoot out enemies' eyes to blind them, or shoot their heels to slow them down, fire arrows with significant knockback, and aim up in the air so that the fires fall like a rainstorm. And then, when the bowman reaches its fourth job, the bowmaster, all the old friends come crawling back to you to invite him or her into the boss missions. The bowmaster is a monster killing machine, and the skill Hurricane, once leveled up, allows him or her to fire anywhere from 480 to 600 arrows a minute. That's up to 10 arrows a second! I understand that most gamers don't waste hundreds of hours level grinding, but it pleases me to see that by staying determined, the unpopular archer becomes a machine gun, but with arrows. Pitt and the fans of the Kid Icarus series have a very interesting relationship. He appeared in the cult classic Hard as Hades Platformer on the NES with one sequel on the Game Boy 
and in the 80s he was considered to be one of Nintendo's greatest stars, alongside the likes of Mario, Samus, and Link. He disappeared for a while, but was supposed to be given a comeback along with Samus by appearing in the original Super Smash Bros. Unfortunately, the developers couldn't figure out how to animate his wings on the N64, and he was replaced with Jigglypuff due to the time constraints. He finally had a triumphant return as a playable character in Brawl, and with new fan popularity, it was hoped that this angel would rise again. When I heard this in the E3 trailer for Uprising, Sorry to keep you waiting! It was just amazing. My mind was blown, and my heart soared like it had the wings of Icarus. Sorry for that nostalgic detour. So, how is Pit as an archer? Well, Pit is a general of the Goddess Palutena's army in a world that is very loosely based off Greek mythology. Since his early career, he's been powering up Palutena's bow to fight Grim Reapers and Eggplant Wizards. And as a general, he at times leads a squad of Centurions to back him up. But his true potential began to be tapped in Brawl. Palutena's bow is probably one of the most versatile bows in gaming. It shoots arrows of pure light which Pitt is very adept at curving for some brilliant trick shots. Pitt never has a problem that other archers have of enemies getting too close, because his wings make him very mobile, and his bow, with sharp edges, can be used as a devastating melee weapon, and even separated into two blades. I've never seen a bow that made you afraid to move in closer before. With Pitt's great dexterity, his crazy weapon, and his flight, he can fight at all ranges. Truth be told, Pitt is a really easy character to spam and brawl. Why is he so overpowered? Oh, Uprising. In his recent 3DS foray, Pit goes from being a fantastic archer to a flight piece of heavy artillery. As it turns out, Pit's mastery does not stop at bows and arrows. He can use swords, hammers, gauntlets, cannons, and other sorts of crazy weapons. But to me, he'll always be a master archer. Let's talk about a very confusing man named Raven from Tales of Vesperia. Right off the bat, I found Raven very interesting when compared to the other Tales characters. Most party members either use a melee weapon or cast spells from a distance. Raven is unique in that he actually has a ranged weapon. Raven is a very talented archer and uses a number of magic arts, usually wind-based to add damage to his arrows while also making his shots a lot flashier. But what if your party already has enough people who fight from afar? What if you want to use Raven alongside Estelle or Rita, two cast-heavy characters? Someone's going to have to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the enemies to give the caster some space. Well, lucky for Brave Vesperia, Raven has taught himself martial arts with a bow. To him, that bow is as good as a short sword. He also keeps an arrow in his offhand at all times to stab with. And by smartly utilizing his delayed volleys, Raven can combo lock like a boss. Raven is also among one of the more interesting party members in the game. Without giving too much away, he's got a bit of an identity crisis. When he first starts traveling with Yuri and the gang, Raven immediately advertises himself to be lazy and a complainer about everything. He says he's too old for everything, but he's only 35. He doesn't even keep his hair or beard in check. He is also this Tales game's obligatory womanizer, much to the chagrin of Judith. However, if any girl does start to show too much feeling back, Raven makes like a bird and flies off, not wanting to really commit to anything. He handles his life and his duties with the same level of detachment. Detachment is the key word that really describes him. While he may know how to fight monsters up close, emotionally Raven distances himself from all of his problems, and prefers to watch the world from a crow's nest rather than actually play a part in it. I just find that so mind-boggling, how his social demeanor reflects classic archery more than his fighting style does. Well, whether you look at him from a combat standpoint or as a character, Raven is a conundrum of an archer that I really enjoyed my time with. Yet another champion from League of Legends. I know it may be fishy that three of the four of these weapons lists so far have had a League character, but with 97 champs and growing, there's a League champ for almost every occasion. And when it comes to bows, Ash definitely earned some recognition. Known as the Frost Archer, Ash hails from the frozen tundra of Freljord. Ash is a direct descendant of the Great Avarosa, which would make her the rightful queen of the region. 
However, Freljord is broken up into dozens of tribes, including two that are also descendants of Avaros' sisters, and those tribes one are dead. There are also some nomadic barbarians, the Yetis, and the Ursine, a pack of sentient polar bears. Ash joined the League of Legends hoping to get enough influence to unite Freljord once again under one rule. With strength and conviction, she has avoided assassination attempts on her life from the likes of Sejuani, who also wants the crown, and made powerful allies with the barbarian Trindamir and the Yursine Volibear. Ash was one of the original champions of League of Legends, and is recommended for anyone trying to learn the game. In fact, if they play the tutorial, Ash is the first champion they ever use. Her range with the bow keeps her safe while she farms experience in gold. She is what you call a late game carry. She may be easy to kill early in the game if she isn't played well, but if you can get over that bump, she really spikes late in the game with ridiculous attack speed, attack damage, and critical hit chance so that she can carry the team through the late game to victory. Auto attacking is her best form of damage, and her abilities help her get those attacks in and farm to level 18. Frost Arrow imbues her shots with ice to slow enemies. Volley shoots 7 Frost Arrows in a wave to clean up minion waves and Hawkshot sends a scouting arrow that lets Ash know if enemies are trying to sneak up on her. Like most archers in video games, Ash works best while standing behind some melee characters so that she can't be the focus of attacks. Her ultimate really makes her a credit to the team. Ash can fire an enchanted crystal arrow, a huge missile-like bolt that can travel the entirety of the map until it hits an enemy champion. It does damage and stuns the target, keeping them stunned for longer the farther it's flown. This encourages Ash to make some tricky skill shots, and the high range stun makes Ash one of the best in the game for initiating team fights. And you gotta love when the enemies escape with a tenth of their health, only for you to pick up the kill from your base. Although League of Legends doesn't have a main character per se, I've always thought of Ash as being the star of the game. She's not on the front of everything, but that's because she's a smart archer. She's hanging back. Since we talk about Ash, let's talk about the character that probably inspired her. Alaria Windrunner is a high elf general from Warcraft 2 and Warcraft 3, and her skills with a longbow are something else. The eldest of the Windrunner clan, this military leader of the Qualthalas forest region was one of the first with the Farsight to see that the Horde would be a danger to them. She battled her fair share of orcs alongside the paladin Turalyon, and her entire family is renowned for their combat prowess and archery skills. During one battle, when her brother and 18 of her clansmen were slain by orcs, Alaria went into a rage and devoted her life to getting revenge on all orc kind. She led her army to capture the Bleeding Hollow Gang, one of the most legendary bands of orc raiders. In time, she was able to set aside her anger and, after the war was won, ran into parts unknown with Turalyon. As of yet, she has made no appearance in World of Warcraft, which might be considered another positive point. Now that I got all the backstory out of the way, let's talk about where Alaria really shows off her talents. She made an appearance as a playable hero in Dota, which for those of you who don't know, stands for Defense of the Ancients, and is a Warcraft 3 online mod game that got such a cult following that it earned itself an official release on Steam, and was originally developed by several of the same people who made League of Legends. In Dota, Alaria is an intelligence-based hero but plays a lot more like an agility hero, this means that while she has high magic damage, she also moves fast and has a wicked attack speed. An ability called Power Shock fires off 1700 feet. It's a lot like Ash's ultimate, except it goes through multiple enemies and destroys trees in its path, and it's only a basic ability for her. Her Shackle Bolt shoots arrows that bind enemy units together, making them easy targets for a Power Shot. When pinned down by multiple enemy heroes, Alaria's main escape mechanism is her patented Windrunner, which turns her invisible and increases her movement speed, making escaping a breeze. Her ultimate, Focus Fire, channels the wind through her very soul and gives her maximum attack speed against a single target, and if her damage is built with the right items, she'll make Swiss cheese of even the tankiest Scourge. Alaria's abilities just seem perfect for an archer, one for single targets, one for sniping, one for binding enemies, and one to escape and start again.
Yes, I prefer the traditional and composite bows to crossbows, and that leads me to place more users of the former on this list. However, one crossbow wielder definitely makes a name for herself, in a game that I barely even played for that matter. This is Kai from Heavenly Sword. Kai is an orphan and a sole survivor of a once proud clan that was wiped out by the armies of King Bohan. Kai is just a little girl, and due to the traumatizing death of her mother at the hands of the flying fox, Kai has developed a mental illness that manifests itself as a kooky and carefree attitude. In this way, she shields herself from realizing just how much bloodshed and turmoil surrounds her. Despite her own wavering spunk and naivete, Kai proves to have quite a brain under her kitty hat. She is smart and resourceful, and a really good shot. She is only playable for a handful of missions, but she instantly proves to be a real Deadeye. In one mission, she has to snipe guards to help Master Shen escape from prison. Using an ability called Aftertouch, Kai fires arrows so that they specifically steer in the air right to the intended point. In this case, the clavicles of enemy soldiers. While exploring areas, Kai can hop about, much like a cat, to get to higher ground where she can safely make her perfect shots. The best example might be when she's trying to get the password for the armory from a guard, who is hiding inside a turret full of fireworks. Yeah, buddy, I'm sure you're safe in there. I mean, it's not like she's smart enough to climb to the top of the tower and fire one perfect bolt through a torch and between the bars of a door to hit that crate and blow up the entire... Oh yeah, she can do that. Kai may act like a younger version of Riku, but she has the wit and reflexes of a cat, and she'll hit your weak point for massive damage. Don't believe me? Let her tell you herself. Hmm. Maybe I'll hit your weak point for massive damage. Monkey Peaches. Huh? The password, it's Monkey Peaches. Thanks. <laughs> One master of the bow and arrow remains, but before we get there, let's recap. Number 10, Joseph Turok. Number 9, Bowyer. Number 8, Link. Number 7, Maple Bowman. Number 6, Pit. Number 5, Raven. Number 4, Ash. Number 3, Alaria Windrunner. And number 2, Kai. What's the problem? I'm nervous. What have I hit her? It's too late for nerves, Rolf. If you're not up to it, just leave it to the master, eh? Watch and learn. One clean motion. No hesitation. This guy. This freaking guy. Shinon is by far the greatest archer in Fire Emblem, and the greatest in all of gaming. First appearing in Path of Radiance, Shinon is a member of the Grail Mercenaries, and he is a total jerk to everyone except his leader Grail. In fact, his character art always has his back to whoever he is talking to. Shinon is already upgraded from archer to sniper at the start of the game, so in an early mission he completely wrecks the opposition. When Grail dies, Shinon refuses to take orders from Ike, who he calls little Ikey, and leaves. Late in the game, Ike finds him again selling his talents to the enemy Dayan, and still being a huge jerk to his superiors. Either Ike or his secret protege Rolf can convince Shinon to rejoin the group, and he is just as awesome as you remember him, given some catch-up training. It's not often that late in the game characters can be useful in Fire Emblem, but Shinon is a clear choice to take to the final boss battle. In Radiant Dawn, he returns as a Grail mercenary, now following Ike but still retaining his air of smugness. His only friend in the world is Gatry, and even he is a constant target for criticism. Shinon seems to be waiting every moment in conversation to snipe back with a witty insult. I doubt the mercenaries would keep him around if it weren't for his incredible aim. If you play him, you know just how amazing he is, especially when you upgrade him to his third class level, Marksman. As a Marksman, Shinon gets the ability Deadeye which adds another chance for him to deal a triple damage critical hit. Deadeye can also put enemies to sleep, but Shinon's target is rarely alive after a critical hit. His damage and accuracy are insane. His speed has him always attacking twice, or four times with a double bow, and he crits constantly. I found that he would often hit on his first attack, and then crit on his second. 
like he was just being a punk and wasting my weapon durability instead of killing them with just one shot. I wouldn't put it past him. Even his defenses are good. He almost always dodges, and while in Fire Emblem you usually want to keep your squishy archer from being attacked up front, Shinon actually has the ability Provoke. He is so much of a raging douchebag that the enemy units prioritize hitting him over other units. If you haven't played Radiant Dawn, you have no idea. Dependable, brilliant, and lovably angry, Shinon bullseyes the number one spot as the greatest archer in video game history. I'm the Green Scorpion, see you guys next time!